We're joined now by Tony Hayward, who is the CEO of Janelle. Uh, he's also the chairman of Glencore as well, and in a previous life was the CEO of a relatively unknown oil company called BP. Uh, welcome to the Oil Council. Uh, I can't help thinking that you don't like making life difficult for yourself. You know, you move from BP, which has its own challenges, now to a much smaller entity, but you're operating in a part of the world where there are some serious problems. Well, I certainly didn't anticipate that we'd find ourselves on the front line in quite the way that we do when we created Ganel, but I think it's, it's worth saying that the situation in Kurdistan on the ground is that it is secure, it is stable. Uh, despite the events of the last three or four months, they have done a fantastic job of preserving the security of the region. And it's interesting just to know that there have been more people killed through terrorist activity on the streets of London in the last 10 years than in Kurdistan. It tells you how secure it is. It's probably not what you'd get from watching the news every night, but it is a fact. Yeah, but, but there is still a degree of, of instability in the area, uh, not least because the, the relationship between the Kurdistan regional government and Baghdad uh, has not been great. Um, I mean, was that something you anticipated when you made the decision to move into Kurdistan in the first place? Yeah, there's been a long-standing dispute between uh, Baghdad and Erbil, the, the capital of the Kurdistan region. I think over, at various stages over the last, well, going back seven or eight years, but certainly over the last three or four, there's been a hope that they would come to the right sort of agreement. And we still believe that that's quite likely. However, the situation on the ground has changed quite dramatically over the last six months. In some senses, the Kurdistan regional government has seized the opportunity of the summer and the uh, emergence of ISIS and everything that's entailed to really sort of take the initiative. And they have now managed to establish exports through Turkey into the international markets in excess of 300,000 barrels a day. They expect to be at 400,000 barrels a day by the end of the year and 500 next year. Uh, we're very confident it's going to happen. It involves, to a large extent, two of Ganel's key fields, Taksak and Torquay, which are today producing 250,000 barrels a day and by the spring will be between them at 350. So we, we think this is all going to happen. The, the thing that's important is that at that level of production, Kurdistan can earn as much from the revenues of selling it, its oil as it can from sharing in the totality of the Iraq production, the so-called central budget allocation. So they are now at a point of what they're referring to as budgetary equilibrium. And of course that means that the na nature of the negotiation between Bagdil, Baghdad and Erbil has a rather different flavour to the one that it had you know, a couple of years ago when Baghdad seemed to have all the, ha all mm -hmm. the cards. But so that, that means if, if you're getting more towards budgetary equilibrium, that's also going to, as you've just recently announced, it's going to sort of liberate those payments and back payments that they owe, uh, which have been suspended up until now, which, you know, for the shareholders might be a cause for concern, but you're saying, no, it's fine, it's the, a minor hiccup, it's all going to work out in the end. Well, the, the reality is that we have a receivable on our balance sheet today with the Kurdistan regional government of about $180 million. In, in the context of a company of our size, that's not a large amount. We expect it to fall through the remainder of the year. I would imagine by the end of the year it'll be around 150 as the process of payments get going. And, you know, in some senses it's entirely understandable. This is a small region. The central government cut off their budget allocation in January. They've had to sort of make do themselves. They've been confronted with this ISIS threat. It, that's cost a lot of money. They've got a humanitarian crisis. So when they look at all of the debtors they have, you know, the international oil companies hitherto have not figured very high on that list. They basically said, look, can you help us out for a bit for the next three or four months until we get, can get this working? And I think, you know, by and large, people have, been, have said, yes, we can. So we, we, all the way through the crisis over the summer, we kept our people on the ground, we kept production running, we've ramped up production significantly, and we're now at the point where you know, that's all going to bring benefit.
Yeah. So where does Janelle go from here then in, in the region? Well, the next step for us, having got the oil ramped up, uh, and indeed the next step for the Kurdistan regional government, is to begin the process of monetizing their very significant gas resources. About a year ago, they signed a gas sales agreement with Turkey, which called for four BCMA of gas exported to Turkey in 2018, 10 in 2020, with the option to go to 20 in 2025 if the gas resource was there. Looks, at, looks like the gas resource will be there. Last week, we concluded an agreement with the Kurdistan regional government to develop both the Miran and Binabawi gas fields. They will become the anchor gas field to satisfy that export gas sales agreement and become the basis on which a domestic market is developed in Kurdistan. So the next step is gas. Yeah. So in the, in the region where you are, you're confident that there is a degree of stability which we haven't seen and didn't expect. But uh, presumably, if you want to grow what is a small entity into a larger entity, you're going to want to expand perhaps in that region. Uh, is that going to be possible? Or and if so, where are you looking? Well, I think we'd be happy continuing to expand in Kurdistan and we look at opportunities all the time. Whether we exercise any of them always comes down to whether you can do a deal. Uh, beyond that, we're looking across the sort of Caspian Middle Eastern area um, and we have also established a number of exploration positions in Africa, in Somaliland, Ethiopia, Morocco in particular. Uh, our exploration program, frankly, this year was not terribly successful. Uh, and we think there is still you know, real prospectivity, particularly in Ethiopia and Somaliland. Just in, in general terms, the, the oil price is, is focusing mines. It's, 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 it's lower. A um, lot of fairly unhappy people about. Uh, what's your view about it? I mean, is it, is it the same as previous oil shocks that we've had in the past? I think it's important to understand exactly how we ended up where we are, if you like. So unlike many, certainly the last two oil shocks, this is not really about demand. Demand is a bit softer this year, but it will still, we'll still see incremental demand growth of perhaps 750,000 barrels a day for the year. So this is really about supply, and it's about really two things. The continuous growth of oil shale in the US, which continues to surprise on the upside in terms of the volume that comes to the market and the pace at which it's coming to the market. And secondly, and the real, the real key is the, what's happened in Libya. For the first half of the year, Libya was off the market. And then it came back onto the market at a million barrels a day. And that, you know, that's sort of a lot to accommodate. So you know, the question is, what happens going forwards? My personal view is we'll see prices soft through the remainder of this year. And in, into next year. I, I do expect prices to start firming up in the second half of next year. I think we will see the consequence of lower prices in activity in the US shell business. And it's not because things aren't economic, it's about cash and liquidity. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the EMP companies that have developed shale oil have not generated free cash flow. They've been consuming all of their cash to invest for the future. They've also accessed the high yield bond market. They have accessed 20% of the high yield bond market. The high yield bond market has got much tougher because quantitative easing has gone away. So that's no longer available in the way it was. And their cash flows will be less at 80 than they mm. were at 100. So they're gonna have to cut capital, not because things aren't economic, but because there just isn't the liquidity in the system that there was over the last couple of years. So exactly what happens, who knows, but you know, it does suggest that the growth going forward will not be as strong as it has been in the last couple of years. And, and do you see that, that that weak growth then being mainly in, in the sort of the, the smaller companies, the companies, many of whom we're talking to here at the Oil Council, who are saying, look, we're able to get oil and gas out of the ground um, more effectively uh, than the big multinationals because they're not concerned with such relatively small, small amounts. Um, and, and they're really quite bullish about it. You would be the other no, way around. No, I'm, I, I don't, but again, it's not about economics. It's not about how much it costs. It's just how much 
capital do they have available? Mm. They will have less capital available to reinvest next year than they had this year. The debt markets are much less benign than they have been. Mm. And their operating cash flow is going to be much less. So they're just not going to have the same quantum of capital to invest. It's probably true, and it certainly looks to be true, that they can develop the onsh onshore US oil shale, certainly in the sweet spots, down to $60 and maybe 50 and even 40 But the fact is, they just won't have the cash flow that they've had historically mm. to invest into it. That will have an impact on the capital. And you're already seeing it. People are talking about reduction of capital of you know, 15 to 20%. Yeah. So does a company like Janelle, which has got sound funding uh, and is probably less affected by that credit squeeze that you're talking about, uh, does that mean that you can see opportunities for Janelle to gobble up some of those opportunities that similar small cap companies are no longer able to do? Well, I certainly believe that the next year, 18 months, maybe two years, will be a time of great opportunity for those companies with strong balance sheets. And we have a strong balance sheet, so yes. All right, so where would you be looking then, if you were well, to look I mean, be beyond the Caspian and beyond yeah, Kurdistan? So we've said, certainly for the time being, and that hasn't changed, that our focus is Middle East and Africa. Mm. Well, Middle East is pretty broadly defined, you know, it's from Turkey to Afghanistan and everything in between. Um, and we, but we're not going to change that. I think it's difficult for a small company to be all over the planet. So we have a regional focus, which is mm. Middle East and Africa, and we'll see what turns up over the course of the next year or 18 months. Mm. Now, you're a, by, by training, you're a geologist. You know, you're one of those guys that, you know, in the early part of your career, was actually on the rigs, and when you discovered uh, the Miller Field, when that, was, when that sort of broke through, you were there. You're finding oil and, and gas you know, in, in other areas now as well. So maybe in a sense you've got a kind of Midas touch, but it, I get the f sense that you, you quite enjoy the exploration, the excitement of being entrepreneurial rather than being part of a large organisation. Well, I certainly enjoy the opportunity to have a go at the entrepreneurial bit. I, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't for a moment change it. 29 years at BP, I had a wonderful time. And the fact is it's relatively few people have the opportunity to both lead a global, uh, truly you know, international oil and gas company such as BP, and at the same time have a go at starting up an EMP company from nothing really, which is what I've been doing for the last three years. Yeah. What, are the, what are the differences between you know, being CEO of BP and being CEO of uh, you know, an entrepreneurial, relatively small enterprise where you haven't got, you haven't got the bureaucracy, you haven't got the, uh, the, the pressure from a whole variety of stakeholders? Is it very different? Is it quite liberating for you? Well, it's both liberating and, you know, you have to, um, you have to feel comfortable with personal risk. You know, when you turn up as BP, you have this big machine behind you, so, Mr. BP. Mm. When I turn up somewhere now, I'm sort of Tony Hayward, right? With this, you know, I'm the CEO, but it's a little, a little oil and gas company. So I think it's great, the liberation, you know, the lack of bureaucracy and the ability to take decisions and more importantly, the ability to make a difference. Mm. I mean, even as a CEO at BP, it's tough to make a difference because it's tough to move the dial. Uh, I remember in, I can't remember, 2009 probably, we made a very big discovery, the Tiber discovery in Gulf of Mexico. We announced it, BP's share price went up 2%. And this was, you know, 5 billion barrels, we said, you know. Mm. And, and I thought, oh, what does it take? And then you start doing the maths, and it was about right. The market cap of the company at the time was $220 billion. We had half of this field, you know, it was for two and a half billion dollars. It, you know, it should have moved the share price 1%, it did. Mm. So in, in a small company, you, with, you know, a closing a deal, finding something, you can really move the dial. And that's the thing that's probably most exciting. And, and maybe it's, uh, as, as you said, as a CEO of a, of, of a BP, you're not actually as close to assessing and managing the risk because it's sort of there for you. There are presumed, whereas there, I mean, you're on your own. Well, I'm not quite on my own, but, I'm, but you know, you know. I, I, we have a small team. But you know, of course, I get to see all the where, every well we're going to drill, and I get the daily report. And you know, it's, mm. you're, you're much closer to the coalface by, by definition, which, which obviously makes it a lot of fun. If you you know, if you have a background that I have, then mm. it does make it a lot of fun. Right. So. Um, you, you're quoted as saying, because you're, you're sort of knocking on a bit now, and uh, you're, you've also got another day job, which is chairman of, of, of Glencore. Some people are saying, well, actually, 
you know, where does it go from here? Uh, can we see you creating a, a big company out of a small company, perhaps going to work for another another major oil company, or what? What next for Tony Hayes? I certainly won't be going for, to work for another major oil company. I've done that. I, I did it with the one that I will always believe was the best, had a fantastic time, so big oil is definitely not on my agenda. I, you know, I will I continue to be involved in Gunnell, but I've said um, publicly that over the next year, 18 months, two years, I will probably move uh, into the sort of chairman role. As you observed, I'm getting on a bit these days, so uh, time to hand over to the next generation. Uh, I love being involved with uh, Glencore, it's a fantastic company. But of course, as a non-executive chairman, you're not in any way in the day-to-day, -day, nor should you be. It's not the role of a chairman. The role of a chairman is to lead the board and make certain the, uh, the executive team is focused on the big strategic issues. All right. Okay, Tony Hayward, the CEO of Janelle, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.